Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar, the show about all things very north and very south. It's me, Chris, and Mario. Hello, Mario. Hello, Chris. I've had a bit of Good a see you. break here. Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah, Happy New Year. Um, yes, we're back with a new episode. Um, sorry, there's no intro music for this one because because uh, technology is not kind to me today. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have collected interesting topics for this um, newsreel episode. We'll look at what has happened over, well, the last weeks and month, probably, in uh, in the polar regions, right? Yep, yep, we will, of course. And uh, we'll go a little bit north and a little bit south. Then let's do that. Um, how do we kick this off? of probably with some animations on a screen of air currents, extreme temperatures. right? Yeah, air yeah, currents. Extreme What's, temperatures. What, what are we looking at here? Yeah, we are looking about at the uh, an animation or at the data on the jet stream. So this uh, uh, current, uh, east bound current in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, actually quite high in the in the stratosphere uh, that the um, that encircles the planet, and uh, with the, the uh, diminishing of the difference between the air temperatures in the subtropical and uh, temperate areas and the polar areas, the jet stream gets more wavy, and uh, this means that the the cold air that is north of the jet stream up here in the northern hemisphere is actually reaching further south where there is a trough in this wavy form that we have seen. We've, and, we've, uh, had, and we've had a similar phenomenon like last year and apparently it's, yeah, that, it's, it happened again this year. Um, I, I mean, now, now we're recording this mid-January um, where the temperatures have already gone back down uh, mostly here in Europe. But uh, we've had some days in between with like 15 Celsius and more, which was yes, very unusual and, and, this time of year. And, and this is this is one of the typical things, especially in North America, where the jet stream typically has a uh, wave down that brings the polar area further south somewhere and, and the wave up that brings the hot water up at, at correspondingly north <laughs> northern latitude uh, is uh, is used as a either uh, as an extreme let's say like well, people maybe i wouldn't name names but uh, somebody saying like, oh, polar like uh, climate uh, warming is not happening look at the freezing temperature we have in chicago or something and 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 then at the same time of course uh, the opposite on the other side i mean this waviness of the jet stream is caused by the temperature being much higher at the than the normal at the northern latitudes, and, and it and seems to similar. It, it seems to result in in more extreme swings over here. Yes, yes, and uh, and we also have uh, recently uh, uh, data that is showing that the ocean is getting is it's never been warmer than this. Like the the seas have never been. Um, storing as much heat as they have now and uh, and also like we like you're saying now it was really interesting when you were saying just before that the temperatures have already gone uh, back down yeah. in 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 the most of Europe well actually here in Norway we have just experienced or we are experiencing actually to be in this day today and yesterday and tomorrow uh, an extreme weather event that is coming more and more frequently and uh, it is uh, caused by a, an atmospheric river coming from uh, the uh, uh, tropical and subtropical areas and bringing saturated water up north. So we are having enormous amount of rain in, uh, in the areas in the, in the west of Norway and lots of wind. And the temperatures up here are in, in the Arctic, in Tromsø, in January yeah. are, yesterday they were like reaching plus five and rain which is unusual 
quite unusual. I mean, <laughs> it happened also previously, but not as frequently because it happened also a couple of years ago and it's happening more and more frequently. Yeah. So it is a frequency of events that is changing and was... it is scary. Yeah, I was I was I was referring to more more central Europe because down here, further down here in Germany, um it's hovering around freezing point right now. So which is yeah, fairly yeah. Re normal for mid January. Yeah, um, but it's not normal that up here way in no, the Arctic we have the same temperatures. No, no, no. We have the same temperatures out the mid Germany and the middle of Germany and the oh, middle yes. of Europe. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's weird. It's uh, extreme events, and uh, there have been uh, there have been uh, actually they have had a warning around the area around Molde, which is in the west of Norway, um, where Norway bulges out towards the the west. <laughs> yes, around mm. West Cape, um, where um, the uh, they have never measured as much rain as it fell yesterday, ever like in the measurements and of course with the problems with the floods and um, landslides snow avalanche or slides uh, of of ice and snow and also something that is really weird here that happens is it it's the ice uh, corks that are happening on the rivers that um, so there is ice on the river it gets blown or or stream down uh, in the valleys until it reaches a point where the ice actually accumulates and it stays there and it creates a dam of ice oh, that wow. if and if there is a lot of liquid water above upstream then this liquid water at one point has enough power to break the ice dam and that creates like uh, flash floods that are not particularly nice Wow, like a like a yeah. plug, pretty much. That yeah, like like a plug like this. Wow. And unfortunately, I mean, Norway is not very densely populated, not even in these areas in the more like in the southern latitudes of of Norway. But it, it is uh, it is quite scary because I mean, you have we have news about things happening all over, right. and uh, and people are involved, of course. Oh. Yeah. Of so uh, so strange, and uh, and this thing about the these atmospheric rivers, so this uh, highly saturated uh, water clogged air masses that are coming north is happening more and more often. I mean, it's very typical from British Columbia. I mean, from the area around British Columbia. So you have air coming from Hawaii coming over towards British Columbia and releasing a lot of precipitation. Um, and it's becoming more and more typical also of the North Atlantic. So I think it was only a couple of years ago that there was uh, a similar event uh, still happening here in Norway. But uh, yeah. Okay, so, let's move on. Yeah, to move on to the next one. Our second item, which is, let me bring up a visual here from the Barnes Observer, ah. um, which is a peculiar looking ship. Yeah, a ship or a barge or it's more than a ship, you right? Call it. It's it's a it's a it's a strange. It's a self-propelled barge or a, a platform that is to be put into the ice and to be uh, floating or drifting in the uh, Arctic ice as a research station, and uh, it's called the, the North Pole, so the Severny Polis. Um, and uh, it has this uh, strange round shape that is probably yeah. made so that you can withstand also freezing on the hull. So, so it and, can be uh, it can be pushed upwards when the ice closes in. Yes, and of course, uh, like our listeners, they all know about uh, the Fram expedition, uh, the first Fram expedition exactly. by Nansen, and uh, and the shape of the ship that was pushed in there. But it's uh, like if the ice pushed the against the sides of the ship, the ship would float up. I think, of course, this is a, a, a much larger ship and it's a 10,000 tons uh, of, of steel and, and others. And, um, but it is, it is built with the same, the same idea. I mean, like if be taken or assisted by an icebreaker into the ice in a position and then left there and to drift. And it has an autonomy of two years. So it can be, 
totally isolated and drift for two years before it needs some refueling probably for the heating and the equipment and also maybe changing of the of the uh, crew and the both scientific and, and technical crew Look, Since, looking at uh, the pictures on uh, yeah. on the arctic.ru on the russian website it does it's also with stands yeah. bottles of champagne being thrown at it it does it does so and i wonder if there was iced probably not <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Yeah, and this uh, this platform is supposed to be uh, going out into the ice now in uh, 2022. So it, they are pretty. It's it's probably going to be positioned at the end of summer. So yeah. we are talking about September, October, uh, beginning of, of winter in the fall of uh, of 2022, and uh, to be drifting up towards the North Pole or where, depending on where it is, and uh, and gathering important data and scientific data so I, on the i remember we've that we've about, that we've talked about this here on the show uh with yeah. that i have talked about this with henry a while ago <laughs> and it's interesting to see that it's now kind of ready to go yeah it's it's uh, a little delayed but it's now finishing up at the yeah at the uh, at the navy shipyard in st petersburg and it's um it's uh, quite um quite an interesting project and uh quite a so the, so the drifting, are, the drifting s platforms, the ice drifting platforms is not a new concept, right? No, it's not a new concept. It's actually uh, started, I mean, the Russians have a, a very long tradition. If you look at this uh, from Wikipedia, with these drifting ice stations, they've been uh, running since, uh, I think it's uh, 1937, he says there, doesn't wow. it? Yes. And uh, and they have had it like regularly with a small interruption, uh, like a small hiatus in between the end of the Soviet Union and the, this is a very continuous the, uh, of the, uh, stream of yeah. new ships or, or new platforms going out. That's interesting. Yes, yes, and uh, and it is quite nice that there are, I I applaud the efforts of keeping up with this uh, because. Of course, there is a, a question of territoriality and then like uh, showing presence in the northern areas. But there is, and there is also probably a strategic, uh, uh, a strategic idea behind this. Of course, like yeah, like the uh, the little flag that was dropped on the on the bottom of the sea at the North Pole and and this. Uh, but 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 there is also scientific data coming out of it. And we have had this uh, mosaic expedition with the Polar Stern. Yeah. Uh, running a couple of years ago uh the the ice drifts are 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 something that is extremely useful to science before the mosaic expedition there was the an ice expedition by the norwegian polar institute with a smaller vessel but of course like when you take an icebreaker and you put it into the ice the icebreaker is is a ship that is made to move and yep. to get out or even an ice reinforced ship or, or an icebreaker i mean this station is made to be Locked into the ice and just resist it. Still, and just a go really and interesting just... concept to me because, um, as a scientist, I I would expect to want more control and to be able to go here and here and here and look at things. But of course, the ice drift itself is part of that research. So, yes, and and you don't well actually if you when you're going when you're going on an icebreaker, the icebreaker creates a lot of disturbance. A True. lot of the service in the in the in the sea ice, of course, because it breaks it and it makes a lot of noise. It makes a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fumes from its own drift, right. um, and and because it uses more power, it creates more fumes. I mean, of course, if you are on a nuclear icebreaker, there is less fumes than than others, but there are might be other problems with it. And uh, so, so being on an on an in a in a in a vessel that is actually an advanced camp because the some of these uh, some of these uh, this uh, timeline of expeditions were actually drifting on on ice flows or uh, or large chunks of ice mm. and and now like putting a, a vessel in it or something a barge something that can float is uh, is actually trying to minimize disturbance from it if it's a of course stealth there is mission, no so to speak yeah yeah Quite, cool and 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 it creates a, a more pleasant environment to work in, in than the than a tent on an ice floe like uh, like these first so stations. so just just curious cuz um i know the realities of being on a ship somewhere you kind of have a constant 
rumbling of a generator running somewhere, so you have electricity. Would those be? Would that be the same there? Like, would there be engines running all the time to keep electricity going, or would they use large battery packs and solar, or something? I think along those I think lines? that this uh, this ship is designed on a on a relatively proven technology so it it, it is resilient as to, in combustion to a lot of yeah because yeah. i mean the survival of the people on board is actually essential to the mission uh, so helps, i yeah. think <laughs> that there are there are probably most probably i don't know about the equipment inside i haven't heard the details or looked into the details of it but uh, there are generators and uh, like the production of drinking water for two years uh, i mean there is definitely a production of drinking water um on you board need de desalination that kind of you stuff. Need desalination plants yeah. either by, by evaporation by osmosis by reverse osmosis so you need power you need and um and you need heating for the for the system but i hope and i trust that they have been thinking about reducing the impact of the of these necessary technical activities i mean it's, by... it's it's both as you as you just said earlier it's it's uh, it's 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 not just climate impact it's also impact on the actual research because you introduce pollution in some form into the environment where um yeah. where that might be counterproductive but yeah yeah it's it's disturbances but uh yeah but uh i think i think that they are trying to minimize it the minimize disturbance, but uh, but it still is getting into an environment with a, with a with a large ship. Of course, a mini a minimal disturbance will be somebody on on skis, <laughs> right? <laughs> with a, a with a with a reindeer <laughs> fur around the shoulders. Yes, yeah, something like that. But uh, of course, you can do different Wouldn't things. Work. It's it's different uh, different kinds of activities. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's for the next topic. Let's stick with Russia. Um, mm -hmm. There's a here's a here's a blurry photo from the Barnes Observer of a ship. Is that is that, okay? First of all, what is this ship, and why on earth is the photo so blurry? It looks like it looks like one of those yeah. Yeti sightings somewhere in the forest. Yeah. Well, this is this is a photo of the largest to date, the largest and most powerful nuclear icebreaker. It the largest and most powerful icebreaker is the Arctica. It's deceptive the photo because it doesn't look huge but it apparently is i think i think the the details the uh, the lights or the the um the portholes with the light look larger because it's blurry and so maybe <laughs> they look they look larger but it's a it's quite a quite an interesting <laughs> technical uh, uh technical question that you put but uh, you're probably best uh I'm, I'm, a, I'm a photographer, why, so, why so the, looking exactly. looking at this, I go, "Hey, you guys could have done better." This looks like a like a, a shaky photo from a ten year old smartphone. I think I think that it might just as well be, Already and uh, it is probably uh, taken by, but not by a professional photographer. I, I probably, Very likely. I mean, I am. Uh, I'm willing to bet that this was taken by somebody on the crew. It takes. Of this it ship. says "Photo yeah. Rosatom," which is yeah, which is the uh, which nuclear... says also on the side of the, of the ship. It says "Rosatom Flot," of yes. course, and it's the it's the owners of the ship. So somebody from on board the ship has walked out. So most powerful icebreaker. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it is the largest uh, icebreaker. It was uh, already launched a couple of years ago, but uh, it had never, uh, it had never gone so far as being in service for so long. And this year, with the need of uh, uh, of uh, assistance for a lot of the ships the, in that were caught in the ice, like we talked uh, a couple of episodes ago, or last episode, uh, we. Um, we have uh, a need for putting all of these uh, equipment into into work. It went also to how to rescue a diesel powered icebreaker out there mm -hmm. uh, and take it over to Pebec. So it's uh, it's it's an interesting also development and and a clear sign of the investment that Russia does on the in the Arctic and uh, it's kind of funny of investment. It's kind of funny because because uh, if you have this most powerful ship then. You will not just be going places because you want to go places, but you will also go places because you are a, 
a massive tow, a massive tow truck to help oh. other ships that are stuck somewhere. I mean, this is this is the primary function of these icebreakers. It's uh, actually assist other ships, rescue and, missions, uh, and assist rescue missions. missions or keeping keeping the northern route open. Yeah, for whatever purposes they might be needed. For whatever yeah. purposes, yeah. And uh, they have also been used uh, sometimes also to give power to villages and uh, and settlements along the coast mm, because okay. they are a, a big power source. Of well, course. They have nuclear, nuclear power. On board. They just mm. they just throw a big cable mm. overboard and yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, we we mentioned a couple of episodes ago of these uh, floating nuclear reactors as well. They have uh, a similar technology, but without having the uh, the navigation capacities and the ice breaking capacities of the of these icebreakers. Yeah. All right. Quite quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, it certainly is. Um, <clears throat> let's let's briefly talk about the next topic i don't want to dwell on it too long but um we have to we have to mention covid of course because uh again this is mid january 2022 and uh there is covid is is has finally reached the antarctic hasn't it yeah i mean uh, it has uh, we have had uh, we have had measures for preventing covid going places and uh and uh, well, we have also seen that uh, with the new strains, especially the new variant, is Omicron variant. Is it's also people that have been vaccinated, uh, they can they can still carry COVID, and the tests are not uh, are not hundred uh, percent reliable. So this is a news about uh, a, a team that have been going through quarantines, double quarantines, and all the tests, fully vaccinated and everything arriving in Antarctica and bringing COVID with them. And this is the Princess Elizabeth Polo Station. And, uh, and they have, they're all okay. They're all well. There are no dire cases. They tried to take the people that uh, in December, they uh, evacuated the people that had COVID, that were detected with COVID and, uh, and their nearest contacts. Um, so, uh, so they tried to remove it from the station, but uh, it's still still lingered so they have had they've had covid now uh since the middle of december down there and it's it's it, i mean it's really hard to isolate on a station that the the station isn't that huge so you, you cannot really um no. separate from each other especially the airflow in the station and that kind of stuff I yeah think. especially because this uh this um princess elizabeth station is uh, built uh, on a, a zero emission of a passive uh, house uh, concept so the air is recycled and and filtered to to keep the heat inside to reduce the uh right to reduce the uh the um energy needs of the of the station and um and of course, like uh, if uh, something is air tra transported by air, uh, like airborne uh, virus particles, then they get all over the station, and uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, an unfortunate uh, an unfortunate aspect. Uh, fortunately, the people that are going down to Antarctica, these stations are being checked medically, and they should be fit and uh, healthy and. Uh, uh, and the good and, the uh, good news yeah. is that um, it's not only vaccinated people going down there, but um, they are also beginning to vaccinate people in Antarctica yes. and research. Well, this is uh, of course uh, like from the BBCs and uh, older articles from October, and uh, the news was that this uh, twin otter had taken the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine down to the Rothera station, yeah. and uh, so that the people that were. Uh, at the station could be and we're not, back, and not be vaccinated look yeah, at the happy girl with a with a happy woman with a uk government box in their hand so that's why bbc <laughs> yeah. is so happy about and with this. the and with the with the oxford vaccine coming down there it's uh, it's of course i mean if you are if you are at rothera in in october you have been doing the overwintering and uh uh, and probably you have not been fully vaccinated with all the different doses before you were left and isolated out there. So, um, so they are taking the vaccines to vaccinate the people before the, the teams before they are taken back into uh, into like Europe, into the UK, into other parts of the world where there was uh, a little more uh, 
of infection than down there. So. Uh, but by the way, can can we go back to the to the Princess uh, Elizabeth station, the one with the COVID infections? Because yeah, the, the yeah. one thing that I didn't show, um, but that that I find interesting is that they are in fact uh, claiming to be a zero emission station. And uh, we see on the f on the picture here, we see the, the the like wind turbines and things having been set up there. Yeah, I mean there is uh, there is of course. Uh, uh, a question mark about the zero emission station um, like how how to make it totally zero emission i mean they don't say carbon neutral but they at least well, just try to yeah as long as people are there there will be emissions of some form yeah as long i mean you see there is an airplane i mean a, what is it a, a dc8 or something isn't it something no, along no. those lines or like no it's even it's even earlier than that it's it must be the one from the um, alpha vegan institute um, um, and uh, I mean, these are uh, it's a one called Constellation, I think. Is it DC3, isn't it? Constellation. Well, I'm not, Possible. I'm not, a, I'm not an, an aircraft uh, expert here, but you can see there are there are wind turbines, yeah, and there are solar panels. And uh, of course, solar panels are working 24 hours a day during the Antarctic uh, uh, summer. Well, you know, they're not and lying, uh, the station itself might be zero emission, that does not include the plane, it's not part of the station, so maybe yeah, that's of a, course. It's a, it's a bit of a it's a bit deceiving to call it a zero emission yeah, station. Yeah, and uh, and I I wonder what they do with the human refuse as well, because uh, like it's kitchen refuse too, yeah. and things is is taken out. But uh, I wonder what they do also with the with these. I mean, here in uh, in Norway there is a technology invented. I mean, or put into practice about uh, incinerating toilets. So so uh, electrical powered uh, toilets that. Uh, that actually incinerate all the refuse, both uh, liquid and, and semi-liquid and solid. And, uh, and that would be, of course, reducing the bulk and the quality of the, of the material that has to be exported, but it still, still needs energy. It takes a run. lot of takes a lot of energy. Yeah, that's that's my yeah, thought. Exactly. And uh, composting probably won't really work that mm. well in that in these temperatures. No. No. And uh, and if we want to be uh, to be taking care of the environment and not leaving any bacteria, any foreign bacteria or other things, parasites or whatever that we might bring there. It's best to take away everything. Yeah. Yeah. Re reminds, me, re reminds me of, 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 a, of another remote place that is not, not, not nearly as remote as Antarctica, and that's Mount Everest, where they uh, now have, have kind of a, ma a mandate to bring back frozen bags of feces from base camp oh, yeah. and, and higher up because that is yeah if it starts thawing it'll be a big stink for sure yeah but also like even if it doesn't thaw i mean what <laughs> what would you do i mean <laughs> it's uh just just maybe, imagine uh, climate change taking its course and uh, it starts thawing up there and uh, all of a sudden this will be kind of one of the uh, one of the most agricultural areas in the world because of all the all the, all, all the fertilizer, the fertilizer. On the other hand, I think that if if climate change begins thawing that up at base camp in in Mount Everest, then mm. I think that we'll have bigger problems and yeah, and bigger challenges than than that. But uh, still, it is it is good to act on on all levels and uh, right. and take away take away what uh, you brought into a place where you shouldn't be. Yeah, right. Yeah, so exactly. one, one form of emissions that might not be as obvious as smoke and CO2 and stuff from burning things is, uh, is microplastics. And of course, we know that a lot of things accumulate up in the Arctic um, as a kind of an indicator of pollution in other places. And uh, microplastics are not an exception there. No, and it's also in the Antarctic. And uh, I mean, microplastics... Uh, uh, we can uh, we can think of microplastic about uh, like for example our our synthetic clothing, especially technical clothing, and uh, and this is something fleece. that uh, fleece for like example, fleece, yeah, like fleece, it and, rubs uh, off and then leaves tiny particles uh, in yeah. the environment. Yeah, it can do it uh, because of like mechanical uh, stress, uh, like just normal wearing. Uh, it can do it because also degradation by solar light. So you have like the UV light and the and the uh, the radiation from from the sun that makes it more brittle, and so you have like small particles. And it can also 
a lot of it comes out when you wash and tumble dry your clothing. So at least in a in a polar station, you're staying there maybe uh, for a season, like four or five months, six months, uh, see down there, probably clothes are being washed. And that's also an interesting thing about how, about the filtering of uh, of the microplastics of the uh, of the uh, the wastewater. In I mean, every, everyone who has, who has a dryer mm. and has uh, dried fleece and other mm. clothing will be aware that the, yeah. that the sieve is, is, is going to be full of dust, of, of, of particles. Of things, yeah. including pl 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 plastic, uh, plastic parts. Yeah. There is also like microplastics coming from other products. Like uh, uh, we have microplastics from plastic bags, plastic products that degrade Uh, either mechanically or by or chemically and are broken into small pieces but this is a a, a project that is by the university of basel that has uh, gone down to antarctica and has tried to measure the microplastics around uh mm, large part in the Weddell Sea, where they were they were on board the Polarstern, the uh, German uh, Alfred Wegener Institute uh, research vessel that we mentioned several times before. They were about in this area and in the Weddell Sea. And, uh, and they measured the microplastics around them. And uh, the interesting part is that, uh, yeah, probably the title also gave it away, that uh, a lot of the microplastics, 80% of the microplastics was coming from their own ship. So as the oh. ship hull is rubbing against the ice and breaking the ice, uh, there are paint chips, small paint chips that are coming out mm. of the of the um, of the hull, and they are left into the environment. And uh, no matter how environmentally friendly you are, you also need to paint the hull of a ship that uh, and and this uh, hull is then uh, is then uh, yeah, the, this paint on the hull is also rubbed off and uh, left into the environment and uh, then of course there are other i mean plastics uh, these remaining 20 percent is uh, coming from other sources that are not relatable to to the to the ship but uh, uh, it is it turned out to be a study about the influence of going into the ice with a ship rather than like mm. a pristine environment of of the, uh, the measurement micro microplastic in a pristine environment is not the, where the transport is coming from other places so I it, mean, seems, it seems it seems that that uh, that yeah. I, i like this because it looks like this was not the expected results they found this nope. uh, and they realized that uh And and I see that realization in some places now that uh, we are where we go, we bring our own stuff and leave a and, lot and there do, without even understanding that we do. Exactly, and uh, I mean when when a ship uh, moves, and also like it's like a, a movable station, of course. And sure. apart from the rubbing of the hull and the, and the uh, and the paint of of the ship, there are all sorts of other things. I mean, there are incinerators for. Uh, For some of the uh, of the refuse, uh, there is the generators. It's like a, it's a diesel, and you can it's a diesel powered ship. So just the engine, the probably, main engine. Yeah, yeah, the engine, the generators. I mean, there are several engines and several generators going all the time, and there is the uh, accidental loss of uh, of things. I mean, when the wind blows, things can be blown off the deck, and uh, if there is even even ropes. That are like synthetic ropes that uh, that uh, flutter in the wind. After a while, they release parts of microplastics that can go Especially. out, and then there is transport from a lot of other places around the world and currents. Antarctica is kind of isolated. We have talked about the circum Antarctic circumpolar current that isolates Antarctica from the influence of currents from in the sea from other parts. So it's difficult for refuse that is floating somehow in the water masses to reach Antarctica or conversely also for refuse that is circling in the Antarctic waters to leave the Antarctic waters but uh, but there is air transport as well and uh, and that's something that uh, especially with the increased interest in going to Antarctica is uh, changing this area from being a totally pristine and untouched area to being an area that is 
just like any other place in the world, very much touched by the hand of humans. Okay, um, we've talked about Polarstern as uh, mm -hmm. the vessel that did that research. Um, they have just launched a new website, Follow Polarstern, yeah. the Alfred Wegener Institute launched this. And uh, uh, for anyone who's interested about where the Polarstern currently is, this is a nice interactive kind of thing. Yeah. You can zoom in on the ship. There's a timeline here right next to it. And if you scroll in the timeline, you'll get uh, not just information on where it was at specific points, but also articles about um, about things that happened at that time around the ship. So you have you'll have a different sources of information there. You have a distance. You have temperatures, wind speeds, and so on. It's it's pretty cool. I'm yeah. It's a, it's a extremely well made, and you have also yeah, you, you can see that it has also the uh, the air temperature and the wind speed uh, on <laughs> live <laughs> on where the ship is and. Yeah. Uh, The timeline is a blog on the side with a timeline links to the different projects that might be on board and what's happening. Of course, it's. I think it's it's a English. fantastic uh, it's a fantastic website. It's one of the best ships website that I've seen. It's a really and, uh, good is a really good example for for uh, for scientific outreach uh, and communication hmm. to the yeah. world. You can share from here. You can like stuff you can look at details and so on it's uh, it's pretty brilliant yeah it's uh it's quite a lot of work that they put into this and uh well, of course before we we're talking about the, the microplastics left by the ship but uh it is it is a, a very well maintained and uh and carefully run operation so i mean i have to put a a good word for what the Polar Stern and the Alpha Vega Institute and uh, and uh, and hopefully also for the newer ship that is coming soon. Yeah. Very nice. Very, very nice. Um, bringing things to the Antarctic. Yeah. Let's stick with that uh, theme for a second. Uh, the next uh, item, again, uh, from, from the BBC. What are we looking at here? Yeah, we're looking at uh, something that is not man-made, that is also coming to Antarctica from other parts of the world. But, but, and, man, uh, we but about, mankind is helping it to go to Antarctica. Yeah, we are helping. We are helping this. And we are helping uh, organisms crossing the barrier that I was mentioning before of the uh, circumpolar current. And, uh, and there are plenty of organisms that are coming with the ships attached to the hull of the ship little hitchhikers to, to antarctica they are hitchhikers and uh, we're talking also about multicellular organisms about i mean we're talking even like blue mussels for example coming over to uh, antarctica and uh, uh, finding reasonably uh, congenial places to settle and uh, to uh, to grow And uh, this is uh, a study that was published on the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, it, is, uh, it is actually in its, in its form of the, uh, this uh, PNAS website is a, um, a paying site if you're not a scientist or I mean, you might uh, uh, in any case uh, be able to read the, uh, the abstract and, uh, and some of the literature in there and some of the conclusions. It is um, actually advocating for better biosecurity uh, measures for ships going to Antarctica. And we're talking about uh, also uh, about the uh, tourist ships, not just the, uh, the scientific uh, expedition ships. There, are, there is a, a large fleet of uh, tourism uh, operation ships uh, that are going to Antarctica from yachts to to larger ships mm. and uh, and it's normal and it's uh, mandatory if you're a member of the IATO of the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators um, to have biosecurity procedures for I just I just remember um, I have not been to Antarctica but a friend of mine has and he told me about the procedures where before before going out on air quotes land They um, they had to like vacuum their backpacks and, and yes. clean their shoes with a 
special yeah. procedure and we go through a whole kind of a decontamination thing to make sure you, they, they wouldn't bring anything from the ship out there. But I, I think this extends further into like stuff just being part yeah. of the, the ship's body in some, in some hull. Yeah, it is, it is part of the ship's hull. I mean, you can have a, a very That's clean true. ship hull just uh, i mean if you have a, a ship that has been just gone to the yard and has had uh, a cleaning of the hull in in europe or even in south america or somewhere it, it will still gather something going down to antarctica now, my question is it down yeah these organ these organisms i mean there, there's a reason they are not uh, endemic to the antarctic uh because of climate because of uh, living conditions and so on um are these organisms that are adapting to well it's the uh, it's, it's it's a new it's a new phenomenon and uh, some i mean some of these organisms are not found in antarctica because of historical reasons because they have never reached down there because of the but they can live the there and they can cope with the climate and some can cope with the climate yeah. with the present climate or they were they had been in Antarctica, but they've been wiped out in the ice ages when the temperatures were were much lower, and uh, and now find a more congenial environment because the temperatures are, are higher. Uh, there are uh, plenty of reasons why organisms are not found in a place rather right. than another one, uh, but are found in another one, and uh, it is playing with fire in bringing things to a place uh, just by yeah by not having been careful enough and and, and a place is, as pristine as the yeah. antarctic and as mm. um mm. i would think fragile as the antarctic yeah. so iato the international association of antarctic tour operators has acknowledged this uh, this article is uh, it's relatively new and uh, so it's acknowledged and they are probably going to be uh, going for recommendations and uh, and rules for their uh, members to uh, prevent as much as possible uh, things uh, like this hitchhiking to happen. Of course, like in a, as you were mentioning, Chris, when when going to Antarctica, let's say if you're going to, for example, South Georgia, you have to call in at the Falkland Islands first, and and you are checked for your procedures uh, and uh, and how you are effectuating your your biosecurity measures uh, for the people going on board and for anything that is going on the ship so like if you have like a proper preventions of uh, uh, rodent um, transport uh, like, yeah uh, rats rats on ships rats and mice yep. and uh, they, they even have uh, uh, rat and mouse dogs that can come on board uh, it's a it's a newer uh, like uh, patrolling that they have not just uh, not just boxes with with bait with poisonous bait because uh, South Georgia has just been uh, recently uh, cleared of of rats and mice and uh, and reindeer um, that were imported by the whalers and uh, and they don't want to get it back there um, so you have this sort of procedures when you come to South Georgia you have to call in a good weekend uh, uh, at least. Uh, uh, once uh, per uh, tour that you do in South Georgia and uh, you are especially in the first tours you're being checked in your procedures so all the boots all the shoes all of the all the backpacks are have to be checked and disinfected and cleaned and they are doing a check a random check of the passengers or a complete check of all the passengers for uh, checking what, and, and not only the passengers, also the crew that is going on, on shore for checking that uh, you don't, we don't bring any foreign organisms. It's it interesting, be a seed, for example, because you be, see this in other places when uh, when species are introduced that um, that the local ecosystem is not prepared for. I remember seeing that in New Zealand, they had the the, the possum uh, being a massive threat to the natural environment probably one of the greatest ones they face and um that that, that that that's really taking over a lot of areas there because hmm. there's nothing that knows how to handle it yes and and we've gone from uh, uh, like in the 
up to the 1800s, at the beginning of the of the of the 1900s, to bringing foreign species to different yeah. places around the globe. And uh, like I remember uh, going uh, shopping in Halifax, and uh, and you walk out of the of the harbor there, and you reach a fantastic Victorian garden with all sorts of plants coming from all over the world but to try to bring an apple into canada or the united states by by airplane you know like <laughs> like these are, are are established institutions where they've taken all sorts of fruit trees right. and uh, and the uh, decorative plants and ornamental plants over and even hitchhikers i mean in a, in a bag of seeds maybe there is also a a bag of something else you know <laughs> like you don't uh you don't have um, you don't have the uh, total control over these things. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, try to let's try to keep Antarctica pristine as much as possible. Now that we know that there can be hitchhikers, let's do that. Um, and last on the list is the endurance. Yes. Now tell us about it. I am sure. A lot, if not all, of our listeners know about the Shackleton ship, the Endurance, right? And uh, the uh, history of the Endurance uh, being taken into the ice and uh, sank, and the rescue of the uh, of the uh, of the crew, uh, where nobody in the crew actually died uh, before they were rescued. They actually had to go or decided to go to war afterwards in World War One. But uh, the Endurance sank in uh, in the Weddell Sea, and uh, uh, a couple of years ago, last year, it was not possible because of COVID. But there was a uh, an expedition trying to locate uh, the Endurance. I think I don't remember the episode in which we talked about this. Well, this year is they are going for another month uh, with the Agulhas too. Uh, the uh, the um, icebreaker from South Africa that you can you would be able to follow uh, uh, on the website and uh, a little bit like the Polar Stern uh, and uh, and uh, they are going to be trying in the month of uh, February now uh, in a couple of weeks to uh, home in into the position where they think that the wreck of the endurance is uh, is lying and. Uh, Try to figure out uh, where it is and how it uh, how it look what it looks like, and uh, hopefully it will be uh, they will be successful. I mean, recently we have had uh, success with the Erebus and the Terror uh, Franklin's expedition in the Northwest Passage. They have, the ships have been found out there and they have been looked for for centuries, <laughs> and and finally they've been found. And uh, so why not the endurance? We're, we're adding that more be, yeah. interesting new technologies. They are talking about like yeah. uh, state-of-the-art hybrid autonomous underwater ve- underwater vehicles to dive down and go for for the search. So there's there's a lot of tech being thrown at this. <laughs> yes, and uh, I mean I there is a very good documentation of what happened by um, by photographs uh, taken. Uh, of the of the ship going down uh, and being broken, so and and nobody died into in on on site there. So one might wonder what is the what is the interest of this? Uh, of course, it's the uh, it has a a, a lot of uh, symbolic value, um, especially for the British public um, uh, to uh, to find the endurance. Uh, but of course, they are also going for uh, for uh, scientific information about what might have happened and the movement of the ice and uh, and also the present day information about the thickness of the ice uh, in the area. They do the need an icebreaker the there for sure. And, yeah. Uh, they do need an icebreaker. This is the uh, 10th of January ice chart by the Norwegian Polar uh, Norwegian Meteorological Institute of the ice service, and you can see that the red part is solid, very close drift ice. So it is possible to move. You can see that uh, it is uh, it is not possible even with an icebreaker like the Agulhas to to go into that ice. But uh, it's still early. And uh, there are still a couple of uh, a couple of weeks to go before they are leaving for this expedition, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to 
to reach uh, in there and uh, and find something this year. All right. And okay. that concludes episode 144 of Curiously Polar. Mario, thank you so much for yes. bringing us all this information. Um, we well, are, thanks to you. We are, we are behind our, our holiday over the year break kind of thing. So um, look forward to the next one, 145 coming to yes. a podcast client near you very soon. Until then, everyone, take care and bye-bye. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Take care.